Welcome each one of you for this um, wonderful session on the future of EdTech and what next for EdTech. Um, I have a very interesting panel with me here. And um, this being like the graveyard shift, we will try as much as possible to make it as fun and interactive. I can already see people smiling, so that means we could be on the right track and trying to, f uh, to see what more can be spoken about around this beautiful topic around EdTech. So for now, my first question to, I guess it's to every single one of you, I just want each one of you to briefly introduce yourselves and speak around briefly, yeah? Briefly, some of the work you've done around EdTech. So I'll start with Tony and then go all the way to the end. You do want to start with Joseph? He's the oh. big deal. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Ouch. Ouch. Thanks, that's Rebecca. Ouch. <laughs> so that you all keep uh, it that's, short. That's my cue. <laughs> I am the average Tony who starts. Uh, it's good to be here. Tony from Kitabu started Kitabu 12 years ago. Um, that was it, right? Yeah, no. What have I, what have I done? Uh, we, we build apps and deliver digital content to educators and students. And that was it, right? I'm trying to keep it short. Yes, there you go. Wow, now I've let's please clap for Tony because I feel that's the shortest he's ever introduced himself. <laughs> <laughs> and that'll encourage you for the future. Yes, Gigi. You've started a trend. I want claps too now. <laughs> They'll clap, yes. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Gigi Ngobo. Um, I work for Ingini, an EdTech accelerator, where I help companies with having more sustainable revenue streams and also fundraising. So, getting external and internal capital. Round of applause for Gigi. <laughs> I started the habit, Kaitan, please awesome. go. And I am Kaitan Mbuya, and I work with Ubongo International. And um, Ubongo International, we create educational, entertaining content for kids. So basically what they're learning in school in different curriculums, we teach the same to them yeah, by you know, using entertaining ways. So cartoons, um, we have comic books. Um, now we've moved into using um, applications, uh, YouTube. So that's the main way that we do. We are now in 32 countries in Africa, um, having offices in around 12 countries. We've done 12 or so languages that are spoken in Africa. Thank you. Thank, thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Oluwa Shionkaede. I'm from Nigeria, and I lead um, School Inca. It's an edtech company in Nigeria where we provide high-quality training to teachers and also help schools find high-quality teaching talent to join their teaching workforce, and we do all of this using our digital platform. Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least. Uh. <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Joseph Sengimana, and I'm with the MasterCard Foundation. I'm the director of the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. Uh, so the center focuses on edtech, uh, right on point for this discussion. Uh, we work with uh, edtech entrepreneurs. I'm actually happy to see that a lot of, a lot of the panelists here are part of the programs, or have been part of the programs. Um, and, um, you know, so Jesse will talk about more of the program as we converse. I don't want to take longer than Tony. <laughs> Thanks, Joseph. Please let a round of applause for um, And maybe I'll just jump right into some of the questions that um, I had as I was going through uh, this topic and trying to, you know, learn more. Being an edtech founder and running a company around um, teaching children, there are lots of things that we can do as um, either facilitators or as teachers, as trainers, as entrepreneurs, um, around, you know, making equitable EdTech equitable. So it could be around uh, helping the learners, training teachers, and building on some of that. I'd like to ask, actually ask um, Olu, what is some of the work you've seen around what you're doing around enabling teachers and teacher training and building their capacity around using not just devices, but even just um, content around teaching them to empower the teacher to be yeah, more all round? All right, thank you so much. Um, I think I would first start from when we started School Inca in 2019. It was just came out of, you know, I did the Teach for Nigeria Fellowship, got out of the fellowship program, and I found out there is a teacher skill gap. Um, so we started this teacher training project, went around schools, um, conduct training programs, bring teachers in person, 50 to 100 of them, to get trained. Um, and in 2020, early 2020, before the pandemic, we started seeing that, of course, we were making impact but it was just a drop in a mighty ocean. And so we started thinking, what can help us scale high quality teacher training? How can we move faster than we're already moving now? And that's when technology came. 
um, you know, came around. And then pandemic as well came in, and of course, it sped up the rate of adoption of technology in education in Nigeria. And so that's when we now start saying, why, you know, we start asking questions. Why don't we use simple tools like Zoom? to conduct training programs. We saw hundreds of teachers join our shared learning communities that we're holding virtually. Um, so that was a proof of concept. Then we started looking, why don't we just build a home where teachers can access training anytime they want and anywhere they want, right? So and that's where the digital platform um, for schooling has started. So we started with a lot of MOOC tools, like um, you know, your open source platforms like WordPress to build something. Um, and we, you know, we used some white label solutions as well to actually create this digital platform. And what we saw is the fact that teachers can actually learn online. Teachers can get coached online. Teachers can get mentored online. And they can use whatever skills they've gained from those online learning experiences to transform learning in their classrooms. Because we also went into the classrooms. We asked questions. We met with students. We conducted surveys to see how that is improving learning outcomes. And we saw that teachers 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 miles away can actually inspire other teachers down back here at home. And then they can make magic happen. And so that's how we've been able to use technology so far. Thank you so much, Olu, and at least for also working with our teachers. Because I think I mentioned a lot of us, as we start building solutions, we think first of the student, then later empower the teacher. So that's a wonderful job. But now for you, Kaitan, you're working around using cartoons to teach um, young minds. And how has that been, especially looking at what we've gone through in 2020 with the pandemic, and now moving on, I'd say, post-pandemic? Um, what is the uptake for some of your um, learning solutions? And also, I think I'd want you to highlight also on learners with disability. What is some of the work that you've done using your solution to help those learners? Great. I think um, when people are going down in the pandemic, we were going up. And, and that was because all children were at home. And taking, for example, here in Kenya, um, the government passed a law that every TV station should do at least six hours every week of educational content. So this was an opportunity for us to use that to reach as many kids as possible. So what we did, we looked for funding and opened up our content to everyone. We used a CC co uh, contract where we're not demanding any money from the broadcasters. But interestingly, by, 2020, by 2021, we had registered around um, 25 TV stations around the country in Kenya alone. And that grew uh, even our reach from just uh, from 12 million, now we are on 32 million um, viewership every single week in, in, in Africa. So that was really good. And, and one thing you noted that is, is we do different research from time to time to try, kind of understand um, what's the, how is our content helping these kids. Um, so we do call, um, um, different research with different age groups and you've come to realize there's been an increase. We did the research in, um, just after the things opened up in 2022 um, in Tanzania and we found there was an increase of around 12% in numeracy, 13% in, in, in literacy. So it was, it was a really good um, thing for us to see all that um, you know, growth in kids, knowing that our content is helping helping kids. Um, in terms of, of, of um, helping kids with disability, um, we've just launched a new show um, some two months ago called Muzo and Namia, and now we are focusing on the age group between six and nine, and we're teaching them literacy um, comprehension most specifically. But then we also have an aspect of neurodiversity that we are targeting, so we're trying to help those kids. We're still doing studies on it. It's a new field for us, hoping to learn more about it. But yeah, it's been, it's been a really an, an interesting journey for us in the last three years to see how how kids can use TV, can use you know tablets, phones to, to, to learn. Um, thinking of it when I was growing up, TV was for entertainment. Yeah, it used to be locked where father and only come home and open it up for you in the evening to watch news and a few you know selected um, shows. But now TV can be used to teach kids. You know, can be used to supplement what the children are learning and are learning in school. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's quite an advancement in technology. Um, thank you, Kaitan. And I think maybe I'll try and coin a new word. Other than entertainment, now we force in edutainment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that now at least the learner is not just singing along A, B, C, or tattoo, tattoo, tattoo. They're also, you know, learning something from it. Um, and so now to you, Tony. <laughs> um, I'd like to know. Yes. Uh, no, wait first. There's a special. So I'd like to know from you, how is your solution driving access to quality education? How is it making it equitable as well? Um, I think education had two turning points in the last five years. Depending on which country you're in, the first was March 7th. For us, that's when lockdown started. So the rest of you, I don't know. Um, the second was November 30th last year. Let's see how many people know what happened November 30th last year. One, two, 
This is interesting. That is when OpenAI put out ChatGPT3. Um, my daughters are on midterm, and I was running out to come for this conference, and I usually am late when I come for these things, so I came here like five minutes to four. I am sorry. <laughs> but, um, and she said, Daddy, I've got this math problem and I need to fix it, and I don't know, you know, help me out, I need to do it. And I pulled out my phone, pulled out ChatGPT, I'm on iOS and Android, it's on iOS. Took a photograph on ChatGPT of the problem and asked, solve this for me. And it refused to give me an answer because I pre-prompted it in the background, because I know my daughters do this. Uh, and it asked the question, what are you trying to solve for? Then I opened a laptop, pulled out, because we use one account, my account, pulled it up, pulled out the specific chat, and said, sweetie, continue. And I ran out. I don't care what I did before. I know now what we're doing. Prior to this, Kitabu has been doing some work in Kenya. We've been here 12 years. That's a long time. I don't look it, but I've been here for a minute. And what we've been focusing on, you see what I'm saying? Like, I was here before education. EdTech was a thing. And, um, and what we've been focusing on is providing digital education for, teach, for content for students and digital resources for teachers. And over the last three months, because of a Gate Foundation grant, we were able to focus specifically on AI. And we pulled an app for students called Somanasi. It's on the Play Store. Somanasi means learns with, learn with us. And an app for teachers called Hodari, Brave. And they interlink. But instead of the kids doing answers, it's conversational assessments. Then what the AI does is it collects their conversational assessments, summarizes it in terms of strengths and weaknesses, and then sends that to the teacher as a, this is Tony's strong point, this is Tony's weak point. So the teacher doesn't have to deal with all my shenanigans. AI does that for, it, for, for the teacher. And then the teacher can be able to, and we're working on this, and it's dodgy because ChatGPT4 is expensive, and the teacher is able to be like, craft an assignment for him that can help him understand the concept of whatever it is I'm bad at. And we are now still figuring out how to do that. But I think for me, the point is, in the last decade and some, we've been able to reach kids specifically one directionally. It's just us have it, you're trying to learn it. That's changed. That's changed completely. That's changed so completely that my, and it's, I don't know how to explain, that every child and parent I find, all I can do is preach artificial intelligence. I don't know the problems that we are going to face in the future. I'm sure they are there. I have no doubt about it, but as far as equity is concerned, I now know that it's feasible for a child not to need a library in their school. And content was always the problem. Access, affordability, and relevance. That was always the problem. Now I'm, I'm believing, I'm starting to be converted into the fact that maybe this will not be an issue anymore. And that's where my head is at. Thank you so much, Tony. And I, I had a feeling we were going to go this direction. And <laughs> A small feeling, an inkling, eh? a small one, a small itch. And um, on that note, maybe I'd like to jump also to Joseph. And just to maybe also highlight some of the work that the MasterCard Foundation has done, and specifically from the CITL. Um, and just to understand, because Tony has brought up something very important, that whatever his child is learning now uh, may, may have changed in the future. And are there like um, some sort of things that you've seen as you work in the center that have actually um, enhanced some of these things or enhanced some of your programs for the youth? Because I know you're majorly trying to help youth, empower youth and actually get them also employable. So are you also enhancing some of their skill to get them to the level where even employers will feel, yes, this is the right person? Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, so you're right, the, the Massacre Foundation's uh, focus is uh, employability for young people. How do we get young people to be employed? Uh, and actually through our Young Africa Work Strategy, the foundation has taken an, uh, a target that by the year 2020, 2030, I'm sorry, uh, that uh, 30 million young Africans would have been enabled to access dignified and fulfilling work. And so when you look at that, then you start to ask, what are the levers that need to be pulled, right, to achieve this objective? And this is where you see education is one of the biggest levers, right, that need to be, to be pulled to be able to accomplish this. And when you look at education in general, then you, on the continent, you start running into a lot of problems. Uh, shortage of teachers, quality of the teachers we already have. Uh, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. And so really 
uh, right then and then, we realized that we need to tap into the power of technology to increase access to quality and relevant education. And so when, when you think along those lines, and this is the, really the, the, the goal of the objective of the center, is to tap into the young people, uh, people who are passionate uh, about education and who have the knowledge of technology and assist them to actually be able to provide these solutions uh, to this particular problem. So we started out in 2019. Uh, we started with the first cohort of 12 edtech companies. Uh, and uh, actually, Tony was one of them. Uh, and then we, we changed to move towards working with tech hubs. Uh, so we're currently working with Ingenie in South Africa, uh, uh, iHub here in Kenya, and CC Hub in Nigeria, supporting um, 36 companies. Uh, we recently completed uh, a call for proposal to increase the number with five new hubs uh, with 60 additional ATA companies. So we want to reach... Please, a round of applause. Come on, guys. <laughs> So we, we want to reach a critical mass of uh, ATEC so that we tip on a continent. So we start using these solutions. And so while we support these ATEC companies, we also work governments, ensuring that there is a, a policy in place, policies in place to create a conducive environment for these companies to grow. So that's what we, we're doing. Um, and then in addition to that, and I think I'll just comment quickly on what Tony touched on around the artificial intelligence and its power, if you will. Um, it is true that uh, actually artificial intelligence has been used uh, in, in education technology for quite some time. Uh, what we are seeing he, like, since last year with ChatGPT was more of a popularization of the AI, specifically around generative AI. Right, but adaptive AI and so on and so forth were being used uh, before. And, and the fact that uh, this is using uh, large language models is actually what really makes a big of a, big of a difference. So you know, you, if you try to Google something, you have to be very precise. Yeah. But if you, you are actually interacting with a, an AI platform, you, you use the way you speak. Uh, and so that makes it easy to, to have that interaction. Um, but I think I will caution us, you know, uh, around these AI platforms, is that the AI platforms is actually built on data. So we need to question what data is this platform being built on. If you look at ChatGPT, uh, the one that's publicly available, is that it's built on internet uh, as it existed in 2021. Um, and if you look at the internet in 2021, you start asking questions around what was out there, the misinformation, the lack of information data from the continent, and so on and so forth. So you start to, to think we need to create ways in which uh, we generate data on the continent and we make that data available. Don't shy away from it, actually participate. I think that's how we can improve how we use AI, not only in education, but in other aspects as well. So thank you very much, Joseph. And I think speaking about what's happening in the continent, we do have quite a lot of ed tech um, startups, ed tech companies growing and uh, giving a lot of solutions to our learners within and for our teachers. So I'd like to find out from you, Gigi, how has Ingenie helped or how is Ingenie also working with um, ed tech startups or even people who have ideas for different ed tech solutions to grow them? and even maybe to scale them across the continent? And are there any learnings that you've gotten so far from your time in Ingenie as well? So just to take a step back, right? Ingenie is an edtech accelerator and we incubate companies for three years. Eight months being active where we give you actual support and then three years inactive but still tracking you to make sure that however we supported you, we've got efficacy. And so with the eight months, what we work with are three pillars. We want market access, so we try to form partnerships with governments and thinking about how do these solutions not only impact the privileged, but actually gain access to schools and rural areas and townships, and thinking about making edtech more equitable. Then we also focus on financial sustainability. 
EdTech is notoriously hard to make money out of, especially in South Africa. When you look at it statistically, about 80% of students go to private government funded schools and then you're asking them to come pay for technology at the end of the day after that. And so you find a big hurdle around actual financial sustainability for companies, so we focus on that as well. And then the third pillar is about impact, because unlike a fintech company where you can just bank, what we are caring about is does the solution actually make the difference that you claim? So if a company is saying, my robotic kits are doing X, Y, Z, is that proven? Do you have data to support that? And does that actually show the efficacy of your product? And so we look at education and edtech in those three spheres. What I've learned in the sector for me, and what's really surprising, is, and it goes back to what Joseph was talking about, how I think we can get a little too excited around edtech, right? It's generative AI, it's this, it's that. Last year it was blockchain, a couple of years ago, decentralized. But I think there's a huge component around educational literacy or technology literacy that isn't covered. Where if you say to me, as a student, you're going to use a chat GPT. How do you actually assess the answers that a ChatGPT gives you? How do you validate that this is the right thing that I'm looking for? How do you actually start to stress test and work with the technology slightly different? And so that's one of the biggest learnings that we've seen, is that in as much as we encourage people to use technology, we also face a hurdle of educating about how to use it responsibly, the ethical implications of technology, thinking about equitable access to it. And so some of those learnings are really, maybe I'm telling a cautionary tale here, is really taking a step back and before diving in, we think about how do the lowest of the pyramid get access to this, but also how is it ethically enabling them to do their work and how do they get training around the sphere. But just to also leave it here, Another thing that I'm really excited about is not even ChatGPT. I've seen a lot of AR and VR coming into the space where kids, one of the companies that we work with is Ambani Africa, and you open up their book and it's actually a digital book that comes out to play. You actually see the VR set, you can wear it and you can play around. And I love that immersive learning that not only takes you from having a conversation like a ChatGPT, but to also get to experience something, to move your mind, to show it new experiences. And so for me, that's been really exciting. Uh, thank you so much. I think I was already imagining what the AR heads, VR AR experience is for the learner, and it just blows my mind.